Reality is not merely a fact, reality is a story. Reality has a plot line. Both Barbie and Hamas are at their core failed love story. The battle between good and evil is the battle between love and unlove, but we need to understand what that means or we'll lose the battle. Evil equals failed love stories. Failed love stories, not to know that the universe is a love story and I participate in that love story, is actually to be insane. The illusion that you could withdraw into your own world and live your private love story has been exploded by this moment in history in which every single one of us participating in this conversation today has a sense of the whole of the world in a way that no previous generation did. See, there's a way to be fierce, full battle between good and evil, and yet infinitely tender with this covenant between the generations, in which no one's out of the story. And there's a spark of the sacred in every broken vessel. To hold that, the Garden of Eden is yeah. not paradise, right? It's paradox. In this moment right now, we actually have to, to do what needs to be done and to stand for love with full fierceness. Next up, we have an uninterrupted podcast with Dr. Mark Gaffney. Although... It was interrupted slightly by some internet connection issues. So if you notice any hiccups in the transmission, just understand that we've tried to weave it together as best we could, but this conversation is fluid and stands alone in a beautiful way. So thank you for your understanding and enjoy this podcast with Dr. Mark Gaffney. Mark, we are back at an insanely challenging and difficult and strange time in the world. And one of the things that we've been talking about is that so much of what we're experiencing is a failed love story. And you could look at not only the evil that exists in the world, but so much of the challenge that exists in the world because we've lost the plot of the universe and our participation in the universe, something you call the cosmoerotic universe. We've lost the plot of the love story and we've forgotten that we're the main characters in this love story. And when we forget the plot, we go off plot. You know that. And when we're off yeah. plot. Yeah. No, that, 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 I mean, that is, I mean, you, you just summarized beautifully. First, it's great to see you, brother. Right. And you just summarized beautifully, you know, the very, very core of cosmetic humanism. And you and I have been in deep conversation about this the last couple of years, but particularly the last several months. You know, as events in the world have exploded in so many ways. And what I've been trying to point towards and what we've been talking about so deeply is, as you said, we got to get beneath the headlines into a place where we can actually make sense. We can actually do sense making. We can engage in the sensuality of sense making and really understand what's happening. And at the very core of it, is this equation evil equals failed love stories failed love stories create evil now mm. that only makes sense if we understand that reality is not empty reality is full and it has inherent Eros and Telos, that reality is not merely a fact, that reality is a story. And this is so deep because what we're doing is we're creating the ground of a world religion, the ground of a new way of being in the world, the ground of what we might call the move from Homo sapien to Homo amor, right? The new human and the new humanity, mm -hmm. which each of us listening in our own lives actually can participate in that, which actually makes life alive and wild and beautiful. So just to follow the thread and then we can deepen, what we've begun to understand is that reality is not really a fact, reality is a story. That by itself is huge. Reality has a plot line. Reality actually has inherent in its structure and narrative arc. Reality's going somewhere. And the plot line of reality is the evolution of love. I mean, it's just so stunning. Mm. And, and we don't mean this in any kind of retro fundamentalist way, nor in a kind of tinsel, superficial, kind of new age way, but as the deepest structure of the interior and exterior sciences. Reality is not merely a fact, reality is a story. 
reality is not an ordinary story. Reality is a love story. Reality is not an ordinary love story. Reality is an evolutionary love story, an outrageous love story. And then finally, and this is where it begins to become literally the single most real thing as a human being that I could hear, which is that my story, my personal story has a plot line. And my personal mm-hmm. story is also a love story. And that love story is not separate from the universal love story. It's not separate from the cosmic love story. My personal love story is a chapter and a verse in the universal love story. Now, once I get that, I understand that that those are not words. All of this is just words until we learn it in the stories of our lives. When I actually begin to understand that's not just words, that's actually the ontological, the true, the real. It's more real than real. It's real. It's reality. Once I get that, then I realize, oh, if that's true, if it's a cosmoerotic universe, if it's an intimate universe, if it's the universal love story, then if I live in the denial of the plot line of my own story, I pathologize. And mm-hmm. I break down, right? And I, I move to act out. So to go insane, insanity is to deny my identity, to deny my place, my nature. I'm not in a love story. If I'm not in a love story, that's not a psychological problem. That's not a mystical problem. That's actually a violation of my core identity. And, and perhaps we could we could go a couple of steps. First, let's kind of show that this is true. But how do we know this is true? Why is this true? So that'd be kind of step one. You know, we can talk about why it's true. But then step two and step three, just to point towards it so we can kind of see where we're going. You know, on October 7th, there's this brutal, horrific attack, probably, you know, as many Gal Gadot from Wonder Woman pointed out, probably the worst atrocity against women, you know, in the last 80 years, right? This kind of systemic abuse and rape and torture and dismemberment of women of all ages in front of each other, a horrific atrocity as Hamas kind of enters Israel. As that's happening, Barbie is playing in the theaters. It's an intimate universe. Those two events seem to have nothing to do with each other at all. But actually, both Barbie and Hamas are inexplicable unless you understand them. This is all absent both from the reviews of Barbie and from the reviews of Hamas, from the news feeds around Hamas, which are massive and everywhere. Both Barbie and Hamas are at their core failed love stories. And that approach Mm -hmm. changes everything. A failed love story creates evil. And there's actually a battle between good and evil. But I can't, the battle between good and evil is the battle between love and unlove. It's the same battle. But we need to understand what that means or we'll lose the battle. We need to understand, so what does the universal love story mean? What does it mean that Barbie's a failed love story? How would that create evil? And, And Barbie is telling the story of what you like to call empire, right? The technocratic, mm-hmm. techno-totalitarian move for control and, and for kind of undermining our essential humanity, which in the end leads towards evil in a very, very deep and profound and horrific way. And of course, the story of Hamas, which is a story that has nothing to do with Israel, by the way. It's, it's, Israel's not part of this, it's a jihad story. Jahada, but Jahada, which means the struggle, the way it's interpreted now in the jihad world, is that the struggle between good and evil is between a certain brand of Islamic faith, militant extreme faith, which is essentially a culture of death against life itself. It's life and anti-life. And of course, jihad happened in Iraq and in Syria with ISIS, Islamic State, without Israel. So in other words, and it's happening in Yemen, with the Houthis, mm-hmm. without Israel. So Israel's not actually the issue. Let's take that off the table. That's a different and important conversation, which we've had, but actually Hamas is, but Hamas at its core, and, and we'll talk about it later, is actually a failed love story. It's a failed story of desire. So that's, that's a, 
Yeah, that's a beginning, my friend. I mean, to begin to lay that on see that <laughs> that would be true. What we just said, we just literally shifted the world on its axis, right? It's a it's a huge right. claim, but we're grounding it in all of the deepest interior and exterior sciences, and and to begin to bring this new story of value to the world is actually this love story as ontological reality is the only way to respond to suffering, pain of the, of the most horrific kind, and to the metacrisis in general, which at its core, the metacrisis is a failed love story. And it's only yeah. the restoration of the cosmorotic universe, the intimate universe, that can actually lead us, take us home, personally and collectively. So, wow. Yeah. So let me gather a few threads and we're going to wow. dive right yeah. into this. Totally. First of all, you, you dropped... You, you dropped the you dropped the the concept of world religion, and I think it's just worth mentioning that when we say that, this is a part of what we mean. It's about understanding the universe, understanding the nature of cosmos itself. And when whenever we say world religion, it's as a context for our own diversity. Right. The many ways you know you lead a group called One Mountain, Many Paths. There's many many ways to understand the nature of the divine and many different practices and many different tracks that you can take, which are all uniquely gorgeous in the way that they've been transmitted through the lineages. And of course, there's the unique challenges that have come with big capital R religion as they've taken these divine sparks and then used them through the forces of empire to wield power and control, et cetera, all of that. But really what we're doing is creating universal truths that allow for a context of diversity of how you worship the names you use, totally. et cetera. So I just wanted to, you know, drop in and, drop and, and give that to people who might have been like, like, oh shit, world religion, what are they talking about? No, no, no. It means, you know, keep your faith. You know, it's just all work together. So instead we're fighting over which God is which and which God is the awesome God and which God you worship means that you need to be destroyed. Like <laughs> we gotta move well beyond that so that we can actually be you know, one planetary civilization and system, not in the empire way, which is total control in a hierarchical pyramid where there's some one person or one governmental agency at the top and through use of force, they control everyone. No, a context for diversity with all of the different tribes and cultures and nations all represented in their own beauty and allowed to flourish in their own unique way. So wanted to pick that thread and then also wanted let's, to let's, let's just grab that speak for, for maybe let's grab that. It's a big one. Okay. That's yeah, a big one. Please. Is that okay? Yeah. Let's grab that for a second. And yeah, that, for that's sure. Great. I'll bracket the next bracket one. The next one. Yeah. So we'll, well, let's drop it in that for a second. It's really important. You know, I, I say to our gang at the center for world philosophy and religion, which, which you're the, the board chair of, and you know, we have a kind of operative sacred instruction, which is we never say the world, the word world religion, without ending as you did world religion as a context for our diversity, right? For the very reasons that you just laid out so beautifully, right? It's world religion always as a context for our diversity, you know, to avoid the sense of a totalizing homogeneity. But when you think about it, the next step, I mean, what is religion? Religion is to re right? It's to re -ligare. Ligare is a ligament, but it's the connective tissue. It's the tissue of eros. So to re is to reconnect means nothing's outside of the love story. So all world religion really means is that nothing is outside the circle and no one's outside the circle. Mm. And it's actually one love and it's one heart and it's one breath. And at a moment, my brother, as we know so deeply in which the challenges of the metacrisis are global, our world, and in which every single one of us participating in this conversation today has a sense of the whole of the world in a way that no previous generation did. You know, if you're listening in the United States, for example, a plane can fly into Manhattan and take down two towers, kind of an attempt to kind of cut off the ballast of the West, if you will, and global is now local. You just went to work in the morning and all of a sudden, a failed love story from some other part of the world came in and destroyed 3,400, 3,500 people, you know, in a period of seconds. So there is no sense of local. We're actually omni-considerate, mm -hmm. Bucky Fuller's word, for the sake of the whole. That's home one more. I feel the whole. So I 
So world religion becomes at that point like breathing. In other words, when we had local problems, you mm. could have local religion, local religare. Of course, that made sense. Now we, by definition, if we don't have a shared story of value, then we have no intimacy. Then we have a global intimacy disorder, a shared love story. And so when we read all the time, and Obs, you and I are so deeply involved in so many different tracks and looking at how do, how do we actually make this da Vinci move, you know, da Vinci, time between worlds, time between stories, you know, tries in the Renaissance to tell a new story because he knows only that can challenge black death and plague and pandemic and breakdown. So that's what we need to do today. We need to tell this new story of value and it has to be a world religion. And, and we have to not be afraid to say that, but it's always a context for our diversity. So the image is, is a unique self symphony in which every religion is a unique instrument in the symphony, but all of them are playing music. And music is eros, music mm -hmm. is love, right? Music is the one love and one eros that animates cosmos. And, and I want to, you know, after your next bracket, which I'm looking forward to, I want to talk about a little bit what we mean so that, you know, friends don't think that we're just declaring this. This is not a new age declaration. I'm, I'm not going to root this notion of the universal love story before we go to Barbie and Hamas. So we, we get that this is real. This is not a, a fantasy. This is literally the most real reality that exists. And, and not to know that, not to know that the universe is a love story and I participate in that love story is actually to be insane. And, and it's why yeah. so much of Western psychology doesn't work because we're operating without knowing basic answers to the basic questions of our identity of who we are and where we are and what ought to be done. And we're trying to do this kind of papered over psychology, which simply breaks down, doesn't work. So if I don't know that I'm in the field of Eros, I'm in the field of she, I'm in the field of a love story, quite literally, that lives uniquely in me, if I don't know that, and I can't actually, so to actually, to go deep into that, actually is the most transformational knowing I can possibly have. But so let's get, but yeah, bracket. So that was just on world religion, which is critical. Yeah, Thank no, you, absolutely. I'm glad, I'm glad you opened that up and finished that thought for sure. Now, what I wanted to voice was just somebody who's saying, well, fuck you guys, because my life hasn't been a love story. My life has been hard, you know, and, th and that's also true that there are certain people who've had a really tough go at this. I mean, and, and you can look at this in any culture. You could look at this as someone who's growing up even in, in Palestine, right? They're not, they're not you know, jihadists, they're not supporting Hamas, but Hamas has taken control and, and limited their availability. I mean, we saw this with Masa Amini in, in Iran, you know, she's in a, she's living in a failed love story where her, she's not able to live her own love story because the failure of somebody else's love story is then impacting her love story and all one of the, story, one you know, the tragedy of so many, right. So the, the tragedy of so many people who've, died in the collateral damage in the conflict in Israel, as well as the direct, the direct casualties. All of this is sometimes the failure of somebody else's love story prevents you from living your own fucking love totally. story, which is why, again, universally, we have to universally affect the love story of the cosmos so everybody has a chance. So we're no, everybody we're has no a chance. longer in a world, you're saying, and beautifully, where, where you can actually withdraw the, the illusion that you could withdraw into your own world and live your private love story has been exploded by this moment in history. So therefore, we have to move from homo sapien to homo amor, and homo amor is this new human who's omni-considered for the sake of the whole, who knows that the universe is a love story and that it has to be one story. There has to be a shared story of value as a context for our diversity. But, but let's go back to the fuck you for a second, because it's so important. There's no one whose story is not a love story, right? So even when my story fails, my story is a love story. You know, as you and I have been talking the last few weeks, I, I get a text thread every day, and I get one text thread, you know, from Gaza, which is about people have been killed in Gaza in the bombings, you know, you know innocent civilians who Hamas has trapped and not allowed to step out or whatever the particular sets of issues are. It's a, 
Hamas is actually, if there's a colonizer, as Douglas Murray pointed out, there's a colonizer in Gaza, it's Hamas. That's, that's quite clear, kind of been quite you know, evident and, and tragic. And so I get a thread of people killed, and then I get a thread of you know, you know, 18, 20, 21-year-old soldiers killed. The thread I got this morning was actually the worst day of the war. It was 10 boys were killed last night. Right, you know, from the time I went to sleep to the time I went up, and you know, four of them, you know, I knew at least indirectly or indirectly their families or people connected to their families, or I'd come across them. I mean, the most beautiful, beautiful people in the world on all sides. The reason murder's a tragedy, and the reason innocent civilians killed in a war is a tragedy, right? And the reason atrocities or atrocities is because they're violating something. In other words, evil mm. is a failure mm. of intimacy. Evil is the opposite of life. There's life and anti-life. Evil is live spelled backwards, if you will, right? In its, in its structure, mm. right? Evil, you know, in, in Aramaic, sitra achra, the other side, the other side is when I turn my back to you. Acher is my back. I turn my back to you. We're no longer face to face. We're no longer in a love story. And so the only reason that I'm suffering is because I understand that my life should be a love story. The only reason hmm. that evil is evil, if the world was empty, if the world was, as our colleague Sam Harris suggests, for example, kind of representing the traditions of reductive materialism, if the world is empty, if it's, if it's over when it's over, if death is the end of the story, which is one of the, the major themes, for example, in the Barbie movie that we'll get to, death is the end of the story, and all meaning is simply made up, then what's the tragedy of a life without love, right? It's the short little blip you have. Love's just a social construction. We made it up anyways, but it's just something that makes you feel a little more comfortable in the few years that you're here, and then game over. And that's the assumption built into both the fundamentalisms of postmodernity, which generate Barbie and which generate a kind of techno totalitarianism in the making, which generate arms merchants, which generate a military industrial complex, which generate a medical industrial complex. The assumption is love's not real. Love's a complete social construction. And Hamas dogmatism or jihadi, right, dogmatism and fundamentalism, which says that actually this world is not a place of eros value. This place is, this world is just a, a hallway leading to the 72 versions in heaven, right? But in this world, desire is to be rejected. Desire is degraded. If I feel desire, that's an expression of a violation. So that's a degraded love story, which itself leads to evil. So it's only evil. It's only suffering because we actually know in our bodies that it's supposed to be a love story, which is why, brother, there's music all over the world, and all the music, all through history, universally, is love songs. It's not because mm -hmm. someone dogmatically imposed it. It's the voice of she, it's the voice of the goddess, the voice of the Shekhinah, the voice of Shiva and Shakti, the voice of Earth Sky, right, of yin yang coming together and saying, oh my God, I'm a love story. And so the songs that I'm going to sing, the mm. music of reality will be love songs. And it's been that way forever, right? We sing love songs, whether it's a country restaurant with a truck, or whether it's a Chinese version, or whether it's you know, an Indonesian version or an African version, or something happened in New Zealand. It's all love songs because reality is a mathematics of intimacy. And when you violate the values of that equation, you create evil. And so just to, to feel this for a second, brethren, you know, before you take us the next step, I mean, we have not seen any place in the public sense-making done by legacy institutions, neither left nor right, right, around the world, right, in an attempt to understand what's happening. We haven't seen one place that actually talks about, I don't know, okay, there's a failed love story. Right? And, and I need to understand that in terms of the battle between good and evil, because if I understand that Hamas is a failed love story, then it changes the way I do the battle between good and evil. And if I understand that 
no one's excluded from the love story. It means that even as I battle Hamas, and even as I have to kill people who committed the worst atrocities of the last 70 years, I nonetheless still don't place them outside of the love story. It's, a, it's different than, for mm -hmm. example, a Zoroastrian position, which is there's good and evil, and they're completely split. That's one way to do the battle between good and evil. When I understand the entire universe is a love story, nothing is excluded from the love story, and it's a love story which goes beyond this lifetime. There's a continuity of consciousness. As I close my eyes in death, I open my eyes into a new reality. Then even those people who are living in a tragic failed love story, and even when we need, because we have no choice, right? Because the world's being held hostage and we need to protect this in future generations, I still realize there's a spark of the sacred, there's a spark of love in every, in every fallen love story, which changes the way we relate. And let's just look for a second and then last sentence, take a look at Germany, take a look at, take a look at Japan. Germany and Japan were the two centers of fascism and, and the worst forms of Nazism, evil. In Germany today, I and mean, it's actually shocking when you talk about the world as a love story, Germany today is a thriving democracy. And in Japan is in multiple ways a thriving democracy. And, and they had fierce failed love stories at the center of their culture. Right? Japanese imperial emperor culture was a failed love story. And ethnocentric, limited story in which love was limited and distorted. And Germany was obviously a failed, Hitler was a failed love story, the, the love of the Aryan race in the most distorted and vicious form. And yet both of those cultures in some deep way have evolved. There's an evolution of love. If we would just exclude them, we would just have to wipe them out forever. But actually there's a way to, to, to actually be fierce, full battle, between good and evil, and yet infinitely tender with this covenant between the generations, in which no one's out of the story. And there's a spark of the sacred in every broken vessel. So that's the, mm. wow, that's, that's, that's to hold that. The Garden of Eden yeah. is not paradise, right? It's paradox. Yeah. And so to then, you know, we planted a seed and some people are thinking, Barbie? <laughs> what the fuck does this have to do with Nazism, fascism, you know, jihadism, what all of these other, all of these other things like, come on, Mark, well, what real. are you talking about? How does this, how does, let's get real here. Let's this is a little, real. you know, this is a, this is a popcorn and bubble gum movie about a Mattel doll and it doesn't matter. And why don't we talk about some real shit? But you actually had a deeper reading of this as really a text. And, and as you say so, you know, so eloquently and so accurately, all of these movies are pointing to sentiments that are living in the fabric of culture itself. And you spotted some things in this film, which I never would have watched unless you made me watch it. So, so, so also thank you and fuck you for making me watch Barbie. But nonetheless, like in watching it and in talking to you, I started to understand what you mean, but there's going to be a lot of people listening who are going like, how the hell are they going to weave Barbie into this fucking conversation? Oh my God. Oh my God. So let, you know, let's talk about Barbie and we'll get back to, we'll get back to showing, you know, and I, you know, to say, we have this like, like radical love commitment that no one gets off of this podcast without seeing Vera clearly for themselves why the universe is a love story and the relationship between Hamas and Barbie and, and how it affects my personal love story. So let's, let's start with Barbie. And just to be clear, right, you made me watch The Covenant in return, so fuck you, right? So there we go on that, right? So, but The Covenant was awesome. It was an awesome movie. So we got, a, we got a movie trade and you also made me watch White Noise. Right? So it's two to one, just being clear. So Barbie, right? So what do we mean when we say that Barbie's a failed love story and that Hamas is a failed love story, or jihad is a failed love story, that there are two forms of fundamentalism and that a failed love story equals evil. So therefore the battle between good and evil needs to be about deepening a love story. Only the deepening of the love story responds to evil. You can't do the battle of good and evil if you bypass the love story. 
So first, let's look at Barbie. So it looks like this very innocent movie. You know, it's got, it's got a big piece of feminine empowerment, which, which is beautiful. It has this major male demonization piece, which is a different conversation. You know, why, why the demonization of the male, which takes place? There's not one positive masculine figure except for the minor character of Alan, who speaks twice. There's no, there's no positive masculine figures, but let's not talk about either of those. Let's talk about the very core of the movie. And let's just take a look at just briefly, because as you said, Obs, and as we've talked about many times before, a movie is a text of culture. So when we're talking about Barbie, we're not talking about what Noah and Greta were thinking when they were hanging out in their apartment in New York as they wrote the movie. That is not our issue in any way. What we're concerned with is how is or what we're paying attention to is how is goddess speaking through the movie? How does Eros, how does the universal love story, how does spirit speak through a movie? And, and I remember, I think I mentioned to you once, I remember you know, hanging out late one night at Lana Wachowski's apartment, and he had just put out a movie called V for Vendetta. And we spend the whole night kind of reading his movie. And it was very clear, we said very clearly, the fact that he made the movie is irrelevant. He gets no authority over that movie. In other words, she speaks through the movie. So let's just take a look at she. So let's just take a quick look at a couple of scenes. So if you remember, in the beginning of Barbie, there's a dance, there's a dance moment. And so at the end of the dance, Ken wants to stay over. And Ken says, you know, hey, you know, maybe I, I thought I might stay over mm -hmm. the night. I'll actually read to the script. And she says, she says, why? Why would you stay over? <laughs> well, why would you even do that? He said, well, we're girlfriend, boyfriend. And she says, well, what would we do? And Ken says, well, I'm, I'm not quite sure. And she says, you know, no, 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 you're just a good friend. And this is my dream house. It's Barbara's dream house. And it's girls night. And it's girls night every night. <laughs> forever. And Ken's like, it's girls night every night, like forever. And she says, yeah, it's every night girls night. Right. And she says, good night. And then she walks inside. And then he kind of says half to himself. He says, I love you too. And the point is, there's no one to say, I love you too. And this is not Barbie, a particular person right. rejecting a particular Ken. Barbie's a doll. She's an archetype. She's a structure of consciousness. This is Barbie and Ken. Barbie is saying to Ken, it's girls' night, this night, every night, quote, forever. There is no love story. It doesn't exist. And that's, that's just one moment in the movie. And then it moves through the whole movie. It's a key theme. So here's episode two or clip two. There's a movement later in the movie when Will Ferrell, who's the bumbling, masculine, patriarchal president of Mattel, you know, says two thirds to the movie, responding to Sasha. And Sasha's the daughter of Gloria who works at Mattel. And she's a key figure in the movie. And Sasha says, well, what about Barbie? And Will Ferrell, president of Mattel says, oh, that's not a problem. Barbie loves Ken. And everyone says, ah, oh, Barbie loves Ken. <laughs> and Barbie says, no, I don't love Ken. Barbie doesn't love Ken, but she's not saying when you read the scene, this mm -hmm. Barbie doesn't love this Ken. She's saying there is no Barbie in Ken. The notion that there would be a Barbie in Ken, that that's a structure of reality is silly. There is no love story. And, and this is so deep, my friends, right? Right. I mean, we thought, Obs, that we could kill all the gods and keep Aphrodite. We could kill the field of value and we keep one value, Eros, love. It doesn't work. Love is only real. Eros is only real if it's in a field of value, if it's part of the universal love story, it's part of the structure of the universe. And along comes Barbie and Barbie says, there's no Barbie in Ken. It actually doesn't exist. So here's a third scene. And just so you see that this is not, this is not a contrived thing. If you actually read the movie carefully, not what no and Greta intended. This is goddess, she, Shekhinah, speaking, crying through the movie, you know, when Ken tries to reinstitute patriarchy at a certain moment in the movie, and then the women inspired by Barbie and Glory and Sasha take over and change the constitution, there's this big moment where kind of Ken wakes up and they have this heart-to-heart -heart talk, Barbie and Ken, 
And Barbie says to him, you know, what are you doing? Right? And he, he says, and I, I'll, I'll give it to you again. It's very beautiful. He says to her, I thought this would be our house. Meaning there's a love story. We'd have, we'd have a house together. And, and she says, I think I owe you an apology. Right? I, I didn't, you know, not every night has to be girls night. So you think she might be coming towards him. Oh, maybe she's recognizing that there's a love story. So he leans over to kiss her and she says, no, 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 there's no, there's none, there's no eros. There's no love desire. That's not real. And then Ken says, but I don't know who I am without you. And she says, you're Ken. Now you'd like her to think, oh, go individuate and be Ken and come back to me. That's exactly not what she means. What she says is, you actually are Ken and I'm Barbie. And there's no intrinsic allurement between us. There's no love story. And then Ken says, mm. but I only exist within the warmth of your gaze. And Ken gets it. In the movie, both in the beginning of the movie, the movie opens where it says, Barbie has a good day every day. Ken only has a good day if he's in Barbie's gaze. So they're mocking Ken. Mm. But it's actually Ken who in the entire movie holds the love story. Mm -hmm. But Ken in the movie is corrupt patriarchy. So what the movie has done, which is shocking, it said, A, there's no love story. There's no Barbie and Ken. That's the exact opposite of the realization in the interior and exterior sciences mm -hmm. of the cosmic universe, which are saying it's Barbie and Ken all the way up and all the way down. So whether it's molecules coming together to form a macromolecule, whether it's your body and the cellular structure of your body, which your body is a dazzling love story, right? Whether it's the movement and allurement of the celestial bodies and the movement of gravity, whether it's the eros that animates electromagnetism, whether it's protons, neutrons, and electrons becoming an atom, reality is Barbie and Ken, Meister Eckhart, the Christian mystic, right? It's reality is kissing all the way up and all the way down. And the four forces, gravity, electromagnetism, the strong and the weak nuclear are forces of eros allurement and autonomy. No, no, no. No, postmodernism says through Barbie, there is no Barbie and Ken. And the only person who actually honors love desire, and we're going to make up a new word here, not love or desire, love desire, one word. The only person who honors love desire is Ken. And he has this song, I'm just Ken, that he sings. And he says in the song, he says, I have feelings I can't explain. They're driving me insane where I see love, she sees a friend. Is it my destiny to live and die a life of brawn, blonde fragility? And then he says one more line. He says, I want to know what's there, what's there to love, to feel the real thing. Is it a crime? Am I not hot when I'm in my feelings? So this is Ken <laughs> standing for the love story. But who's Ken? A blithering idiot, right? He is degraded patriarchy in the movie. So in this movie that became the biggest box office hit that's playing in theaters as jihad enters Israel in this tragic moment, the basic point to the movie is there is no love story because there's no field of value in Cosmos and there's no field of Eros because Eros is a value of Cosmos right? and Aphrodite is part of the field, it's part of the universal love story. All that's not true. The entire thing is completely made up. And the only people who think there's a love story are people who are using love for power, which is degraded patriarchy. And maybe last, last two images, which are just kind of, they're wild. The song Indigo Girls, Closer to Fine, right, appears three times in the movie. It's also in the trailer of the movie. So what's the song Indigo Girls about? It's about one thing. There's no love story. There's no story of value. It's not real. And the actual refrain of the song is, you know, when I went to the doctor, I went to the mountain, I looked to the children, I drank from the fountains. And then what happens? But there's no one answer to any question. There's more than one answer to these questions. And actually, the less I seek my source for some definitive, the closer mm. I am to find. And some definitive means something that's real, that's not created, that's not made up. And actually in, and that song plays three times. And the point is I'm closer to fine when I give up the field of value, when I give up the field of eros, when I give up the fact that I'm an expression and participate in the universal love story. And finally, you've got Mrs. Mattel talking to Barbie. 
And Mr. Mattel says to Barb, he wants to become human. She's like, wow, that's a surprise. Why would you want to become human? She says, humans basically make up meaning and they die. Like, why would you want to do that? And Barbie, being a good existentialist, says, well, I'd like to participate in that social construction of meaning because it's very beautiful, so, so great. But actually, there is no real meaning. And there is no real, therefore, eros. And there is no eros value. Yeah. And the universe is not a love story. So that's, that's shocking. Do you, <laughs> what would you say about this reading that just occurs to me as I'm thinking about it? Wow. In this, uh, read this as a, as a transhumanist Please. empire fantasy where empire is actually a projection of the ego, which wants to know itself in relative position to everybody else and be dominant in that relative position, which is why all of the dictators of all communist revolutions like Mao or Stalin, it's like everybody's equal except for me, except for me. I'm at the fucking top and I can do whatever the fuck that I want. And I'm in control of everything and I'm the most powerful. Let's make a bunch of fucking statues of me and have people read books about me, 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 me. And it's in this complete Complete, absolute, like I am the father of all of all people, and everybody else is beneath me. And there's this kind of idea as empires making its move to create this totalizing hierarchy where there's going to be elites, which will eventually battle themselves until there's one final elite that's at the very top of the pyramid because multiple elites, they may share the ring of power for a while, but they'll all fight each other. It's in all the stories of culture. They'll all fight each other for the absolute ring of power until there's one Sauron, there's one Mao, there's one Stalin, there's one Hitler, there's one person at the top. And there's also this movement that's well, let's decontextualize and de-eroticize the world. And actually, these dolls are a creation of a corporation, which ultimately is kind of like an embodiment of this entity of total control power. A corporation wants to make as much money as possible, swallow up as many other competitors as possible until they're at the very top. But these things seem kind of connected where empire and then this kind of post postmodern agenda to de-eroticize love because love, and I forget who said this beautiful quote, but they want to control love. And by they, I mean empire. Empire wants to control love or totalitarianism wants to control love because love is something they can't control. So if you create dolls with no, with no genitals and that's the whole creation of the thing, then you can be at the okay. very top of everything and there's no one who will have okay. the energy, the fuck to actually challenge you. Which is also why Mao in the communist revolution made all of the women dress like boys, cut off all of their hair, de-eroticize the whole, you know, body politic of all the citizens, wipe out as many as possible, and then create this totalizing, you know, control, which is also cutting off people's love, not only between each other, but cutting off people's love to the divine until all there is left to love is the person at the top, you know, which is the dictator, which is the tyrant. Yeah, no, that's, but that's yeah. that 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 is beautiful and important. So let's let's just unpack. You said a lot there. Let's unpack this, and it's so important in terms of how we live our lives. So one, love is revolutionary by its nature. Right? Love is subversive. Right? Love is by its nature it subverts. So just even very simply, in, in the language of what my friend Barb Marx Hubbard who was your predecessor as the, the chair of the Center for World Philosophy and Religion, would call win-lose metrics, rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics. And in that structure, everything is about you're either giving or you're receiving. Mm. You're putting money in the bank, you're taking money out. Love undermines that. And love desire, when you're in the throes of love desire, the split between giving and receiving disappears and actually giving and receiving become one. So love undermines the win-lose metrics. Love means I'm willing to bracket, what does love mean? It means I'm willing to bracket my egoic mm -hmm. self for a moment to be in devotion to your transformation, right? To your growth. That's what it means to love. It means I bracket the win-lose metrics and I'm in devotion. I'm madly excited about mm -hmm. Aubreyness and I don't view Aubreyness as an instrument to Markness. Right? So that, that is what love means. So love brackets the movement of empire, brackets the win-lose metrics. Love is subversive, love's revolutionary. And so by definition, it stands against empire. It stands against the win-lose metrics. It stands against 
this notion that we've talked about you know, for so many years, which is that it's not that there's a particular conspiracy theory, it's not that there's a cabal necessarily, it's that the very structure of reality is a structure of win-lose metrics, it's a structure of a, a kind of anti-erotic, non-intimate universe. Now, that's why George Orwell in 1984 Right, places empire mm. or totalitarianism in the ministry of love. There's a ministry of love, and, and you actually take Winston and Julia, and the entire point of 1984 is that we're going to break the love story between Winston and Julia. That's the entire point. If we can break that love story, that ultimate love story, if we break that love story, then actually and tragically, Moloch, right, that idolatrous force that Ginsburg talked about and described reality as Moloch, Moloch being the, the structure of the win lose metrics, right? The structure of the absurd Moloch win. And then Walden II by B.F. Skinner, who's the informative force defining the entire tech flex that we're now writing on. As you know, we've been talking about it. Skinner describes Walden II, which is essentially a worldwide, it's a city that he describes, it's a, a city called Walden II. He's responding to Thoreau's Walden I, which is about self-reliance and love and community, right, and autonomy, right, and communion all together. And he's saying, no, Walden II. He's saying, no, actually, love's not real. And you actually create mm. simulations of love, Barbie dolls. You actually commodify love. Right, but it's controlled, and it's not actually a, a true force because the actual assumption of the mainstream of kind of the intelligentsia that dominates the Western Academy is that actually love is not real and value is not real, and there's no Barbie and Ken. And so therefore the love story starts, right, the revolution starts with actually the reclaiming of the love story. You can't actually respond to the meta crisis without reclaiming the love story, because the core of the meta crisis at its core is two things. It's rivalrous conflict governed by win-lose metrics, meaning that there's always win-lose metrics, there's never a love story. And there's what we call a fragile system. What's a fragile system? In Taleb, for example, research, a fragile system means a system where the parts don't know each other, or the way we say it in the new story of value in cosmorotic humanism, where the parts aren't allured to each other. And since the parts mm. aren't allured to each other, the system's fragile. Love mm. is anti-fragile. Love or fuck yeah. is unfuckable. Right? In other words, that's its nature. So it's only when I, I mean it's beautiful, right? It's only when I realize, oh, reality is a love story, and that that reality is is, is an intimate universe, but that that intimacy literally lives in me. And that's the sense I think we said when we first met. Right back like a year and a half ago, it's not just that I live in the intimate universe. The intimate universe lives in me until I actually get that that's true atomically, molecularly, you know, neuronically, you know, nerve endings, microbiome, right? And, you know, my microbiome, which is, which is you know, where 70% of my immune system live in which there's complete intimacy between me and the rest of the larger, the larger environment. There's a complete larger, wider shared identity. Unless I begin to realize the whole thing is a love story, then basically people are atomized against each other. Pseudo eros, right? Surface fulfillments of grasping and seeking, right? Dominate the day. And you devise a world of a level of mental breakdown, right? A level of incoherence, right? A level of loneliness. An intense, intense loneliness. Because since love's not real, loneliness can never be overcome. If the world is not a love story, if there's no field of value, there's no field of eros, you can never overcome loneliness. But it's not just love we're talking about, it's love desire. And I think that's what you're pointing to. Totalitarianism seeks to undermine love desire. So Barbie and Ken aren't real, number one. And number two, 
to the extent that they exist, they have no genitals, meaning the corporation has actually deconstructed any reality to desire because desire is subversive. You see, desire means that divinity courses in my body. Mm -hmm. There's dignity to desire. I feel the aliveness of my body. I feel that the bill of right is encrypted in my body sacred. I know that to touch, to arouse, is this enormous power I have. And, and desire democratizes power because desire is the power to give and receive pleasure as the self-evident value, in which I realize I'm a king and a queen. Whenever I come together with my beloved, I'm king and queen. And I'm always in, in my infinite sheenness, godness, which is why at a moment of orgasm, we cry out, oh God. Mm -hmm. And so totalitarianism has to actually come in between me and my body. The body is a love story, literally. Molecularly, we said earlier, atomically, the body is literally in all of its structures, a love story. And so totalitarianism has to come in between my own capacity to trust my desire, to trust my body. And if I can break my capacity to trust my body, when I lose the self-authorship and the authority over the depth of my own desire, and we're not talking about surface desire, we're talking about my ability to actually clarify my desire, to access my, my deepest heart's desire, my deepest heart's desire is what stands against empire. Intimate yeah. communion between people gathering stands against empire. And, wow. and all right, so let's look at another few movies from culture because these movies speak, and there's countless examples of this, but I'm gonna play two for you. All right, so William Wallace, under, under the yoke of Longshanks, a ruthless, you know, British emperor, really, king, but an emperor acting as an emperor, right? Because we use king in a, in a positive connotation, but he's the king as emperor, trying to control everyone, trying to control Scotland. And William Wallace, a powerful warrior, filled with fuck, you know, filled with, you know, not only love, desire, but a sense of goodness. But he was actually happy to have a small cottage somewhere, maybe out in the glade and raise a couple kids. And, and then empire presses a little too close. They try to rape his beloved. He goes on a, on a you know, little rampage and they try to escape but they catch Murrin, his beloved, who he just married in the secret glade. And they have this scene where he takes off her, her cloak and then he, the hot breath as he's naked and she's naked, you know, is on her, on her neck. And you just feel her body open and quiver with the tenderness of this passionate lovemaking that's about to occur to consummate their marriage. And you see this love desire fill with him. And he was happy to lay down his sword. He was the wildly trained strategist, technician, warrior, but he was happy to just, it's okay, Empire's got this, but I'm gonna carve out my little love story. Well, Empire pushes too close and they kill his beloved. And then William Wallace becomes no longer William Wallace. He becomes a hero, like a real, like a real hero. And we see this like happening where Empire pushes too far and it awakens the lions, it awakens the dragons, it awakens the inner warrior hero that we have. And <clears throat> I think it's always why I get emotional watching these movies because it's it's there's a there's if we have the love story in the in the private personal, we can kind of say, ah, it's okay, the world is kind of tough. But the moment that Empire presses a little too close you know, and however that is, it awakens something within somebody. And sometimes it's not even, not even the romantic love story. I mean, look at the whole John Wick series. They made, they fucked up. They made a mistake. He buried his guns. He was living in a house and he just loved his dog. He loved his dog. They done fucked up. They killed his dog. And then four movies later and 500 headshots and the absolute, the absolute destruction of this oppressive control of empire through this assassin's kind of community. They just unleashed hell. Same as what Longshanks and, and the British Empire did when they yeah. pressed against Wall. And we know this is true. But if they were able to degrade love itself, 
they wouldn't awaken the warriors. But if they don't right. degrade love, right. they're going to continue to awaken the warriors, the Lions of Judah, the William Wallaces, even the sense, John Wicks. No, that's beautiful. And, and in that sense, culture, she, the love story, speaks through John Wicks, speaks through William Wallace, speaks through the realization, let's say, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, that Aragon and Arwen and that great love story is going to actually animate and change the destiny of history. And so then what happens is Moloch, if you will, right, to borrow again Ginsburg's phrase, or empire, if we'll use that for kind of the machinery of unlove, mm. the machinery of the non-intimate universe, makes a far more insidious move than Longshanks, which right. is Barbie. Right. Right. And Barbie is actually not innocent. You actually have a feeling when you leave the movie, you're slightly chilled. There's something a little bit, right? It's the same feeling you have when you finish reading my colleague and, and bless his soul, my colleague Yuval Harari, who wrote a book called Homo Sapiens. And the basic point of the book is that there's this big story, but there's no love story. That eros and value are not a quality of cosmos. There's no field of value. And there's no field of eros, and it's eros value, which is goodness. Goodness and love are one. There's no split between goodness and love. They're precisely the same. Eros is the right relationship. It's the right ethos between parts. So when you finish reading Harari's book, Sapiens, you're just, you have the same chilled feeling. You're not quite sure why you're uncomfortable, and you have the sense of ennui right, as Steiner put it, the sense of something's been deconstructed, the world's not all right. That actually is, is devastating when you leave the Barbie movie. And I must have asked 100 people in the last three months, how'd you feel when you left the movie? Funny, right? There's this insertion of a kind of parasitic virus that seeks to deconstruct the love story itself. And that's one deconstruction of the love story. That's one fundamentalism. Now, jihad in its expression as ISIS or as Hamas is actually also a second failed love story. And here the failed love story is, one, desire is evil. That's the first thing. Desire is evil. That's critical. So the experience of desire is evil. Now, the experience of desire is about the dignity of the human body and that the human body is this living, breathing, pulsing, throbbing expression of desire. So one is desire itself is evil. That's number one. Number two, there's no field of eros, which is a field of value in which all of reality participates. Humans, every human being, in the animal world, in the atomic world, there's no shared field of desire. There's not even a shared field of desire and eros and value between human beings. There's a line that splits, splits reality. It's dar el harb and dar el islam. There's those who should be put to death by the line of the sword. And those very small, narrow group of people, we're not sure, are they Sunnis? Are they Shias? Are they Isis? But a very tiny group, only they are beloved of God. So it's an abusive love story in which, A, those in it, abuse the body, number one, right? because the body is not a place which is sacred. So you actually bypass the dignity of the body, which is why you have incest, honor killing, right, abuse at the highest rates in the world within that kind of fundamentalist culture. The body has no dignity. Desire has no dignity. So when desire has no dignity and everyone else is the people who should be destroyed by the sword, what you're saying is there's no field of eros value. So now you're experiencing desire in yourself. What do you do with that? You project desire, which is evil, onto the other, and then you torture them. Mm -hmm. That's torture is the inverse of the love story. Right? And it's when there's no love story, when there's no field of eros value, so you don't caress, you don't make love, you don't arouse. The opposite of love desire is literally torture. Right? Mm -hmm. So what happens is, so then we project the experience of evil living in my body because I'm a young Hamas man and I'm experiencing desire. That, that, that's evil. I project it out on the other 
The other is anyone who's outside of my inner circle. And then I go not just to kill them, but I go to dismember them. And, and we have, as even the UN now is, we have more forensic evidence of brutality of cutting off limbs as you rape someone and then shooting them and then continuing to rape them. I mean, so in other words, and, and this is happening, not naturally, right? They were taking all the Hamas boys, like the ISIS boys, were jacked up on amphetamines, which turned off the love story of the body and jacked up the aggressive centers and completely depressed or turned off the centers of love of empathy in the body. So they turned off the love story in the body. They lived in a story which was an anti-erotic story, a story which violates intimacy. And then they exploded in the tragedy of jihad and atrocity because it's a failed love story. But, but when, when I get that, I have to understand they're not actually intrinsically evil devils, a.k.a. Zoroastrianism, that they're not actually of Ahura Mazda, they're actually of the other side. No, no, no. They're part of the love story. They're part of the field of Eros, mm -hmm. which is why they've got to take those amphetamines, which is why it's a failed love story that turns them to evil. So both on the Hamas side, a, foul, a failed story of the dignity of desire, a failed love story, which is ethnocentric and only those inside of my circle are deserving of love. The body's not a love story. That's what produces atrocity on the one side. On the other side, Barbie's a failed love story. Love is commodified, owned, and whether it's Skinner in Walden 2, talks about creating a community in which love is controlled and contrived and commodified, but it's not real, or whether it's Orwell, who talks about the Ministry of Love in 1984, or whether it's Barbie, who says there's no Barbie in Ken, they're all saying the same thing. And actually, we're going to control reality, and we're going to do that by actually saying there's no dignity to desire, there's no love story, there's no love desire. So strangely and paradoxically, these two sides of the world, the postmodern deconstruction as expressed in Barbie, which animates Moloch or empire on the one hand, and the tragic Hamas culture of death, which is anti-life, they're both evil. They both generate evil of completely different forms over time, but they're evil because they're failed love stories. Mm -hmm. And that's hopeful. So that's yeah. the thing. That's hopeful. Yeah. That's hopeful because, because the love story is real and it can be re-aroused. Right. We've got to tell a new story and show it to be true. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, uh, I'm going to open up something that uh, we won't get Please. to fully conclude in this, but you know, as I look at the cosmos, as I've come to understand it through my psychonautics, and, you know, we've had some discussions about this. We had a beautiful discussion in New York about it. The, you know, the one, the one you could say splits into two opposing forces, right? But it's all the one, which is the love story, right? Which is Shekinah, which is, which is the divine, which is the Tao, which is the mystery. It's, it is all a love story. But then there's a split into polarity, life and anti-life. You could split it a bunch of different ways. And there is an intending, an intending non-planetary, -ex, non extra-dimensional force that is like a, it's not God, but it is a demon, basically, a demonic force. And I think there's also a place where people can be in a love story with this demonic force, right? Where this force is actually, they're in worship, an active devotional worship for death, for this culture of death, for this culture of anti-life. And there can be a pleasure in worshiping this demon. Now, well, the way that I've seen it, actually, as I've explored this, even since our conversation, which was fairly recent, what I see is that actually that force is still a part of the love story. Because as the one splits into polarity, which I saw it actually happening in a journey, I saw it happening as a wobble where the one just started to wobble and created this sine wave of peaks and valleys. And so in, this, in the sine wave, which is the ups and downs, there was polarity that was created. There was the top, there was a peak, and there was the bottom. 
And as it's split, as it's split, those that force on the dark side, on the downswing, let's call it, actually has the same impulse to return to love, which is unification, which is absolute unification. So it has this desire to return. And in its failure to be able to do that because it's, it's locked in polarity. So if you go down the dimensional cosmos, like Matthias would say, if like ninth dimension, you start going down to seventh dimension, which is where these extra dimensional forces actually live. They actually are trying to destroy everything because in the destruction of all creation and everything, there'll be the void, which is oneness, which is back to unification with love. So the idea of the fallen angel, really the fallen angel just says, I want to get back to the house of God, of love. So my way to do that is actually destroy everything. Whereas the other four says, no, 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 no. Let's create all unique intimate possibilities and return to unification with love through the other side. So even, even on these other sides, even though their intention may be pure destruction, they're still part of the love story. So Ahura Mazda and Angra Menu are still in this drive to actually return to the one love, return yeah, to the one love. Doing, that's very, very, very beautiful. You're, of course, gorgeously kind of weaving our Mazda, right, into the lineage of Solomon. You're kind of overcoming the split in Zoroastrianism. Right. And you're kind of reading it, you know, in a Solomonic lineage, uh, uh, which I think is a beautiful reading. You know, whether our friend Alexander will have to talk to him would agree is a different conversation. But but I, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, that's what you're saying is so beautifully true in terms of the essence of reality, which means, and, and to make it, you know, most personal and intimate, Evil doesn't live out there. Evil, evil lives everywhere. Yep. Right? Evil is the anti-life force. It's, it's the place when you're in the middle of an argument, which is fierce, and you're just going to say, fuck you, I'm walking out. I'm not going to reach in and find the place where I've got a part of this contribution system, and I'm just not climbing down from the fucking tree because I just won't do it. Right? That place where I won't brack itself right, for the sake of, of feeling other, right, this mutuality of feeling, that's, that's the root of evil. It, you, mm -hmm. you, can't, you can't be in a safe house. You can't be, have your gun looking into a safe house in an Israeli kibbutz and see four children and shoot them in the belly in front of their, and, and not be disconnected from your ability to feel the field, right? So you, what, what clearly, you, you've lost connection to the love story, but then afterwards, and as we heard one of the recordings, you call home, as one of the Hamas boys did, and he tells his mother, are you proud of me? Right? So he, right? So in other words, and, and that requires from us this very, very painful, poignant, fierce paradox, meaning we have to act and make war for peace, just like mm -hmm. we make love for peace. We sometimes have to make war for peace. That's what we had to do in response to Nazism. We can't actually allow atrocity to stand. And at the same time, we remember that Germany transformed itself, right? And that the son of the Sheikh, right, who was the animating force of that anti-love story of Hamas, the son found his way and actually, right, became a hero. Right? And so there's no Hamas boy right, or Hamas woman who ultimately, in the arc of history, can't actually find their way back to the love story. And in this moment right now, we actually have to, to do what needs to be done and right, to stand for love with full fierceness. William Wallace right, had to do what William Wallace had to do for the sake of love. And mm -hmm. so it requires from us this intense and stunning and infinitely painful and poignant paradox, which is we, we, we wield the sword fiercely for the sake of love, right? Yeah. right? And that actually needs to be done. The Allies needed to do that in World War II. When Tom Hanks made Saving, Saving Private Ryan and those boys swept the beaches of Normandy, those boys were, 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 had a sacred impulse of love animating their hearts. And... And no one's ever ultimately out of the story. 
Right? Yeah. No demon doesn't find their way back. And even the orcs in Tolkien, right, in The Lord of the Rings, the orcs were originally elves, right, who had fallen. Right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's always a way home. And sometimes it's in this incarnation. And sometimes it's in the next incarnation, which is why I always have to, to hold this widest love story and act fiercely for it. And, and right now, the most revolutionary act we can do is to actually, just like we established democracy in the world. Democracy was a joke a thousand years ago. 500 years ago, a bunch of people get together in Florence and they tell this new story. And all of a sudden you have democracy and you have universal human rights, which is the movement of a love story. And right now in this time between worlds, we can't go Hamas. We can't go the old religions. We can't go a deconstructed postmodernism in Barbie. So what we have to do is actually is tell a new story, which brings interior sciences and exterior sciences, which lives in us. And I actually have a direct experience that my love story matters infinitely to cosmos, that my desire matters infinitely. And we just have to tell this new, not declared story, not made up story, but this grounded, gorgeous, stunning story of love and desire and every man, woman, and child needs to grow up and know that story and grow into that story. And, and that shift, that transformation, that it's a revolution of love, but, but again, not in a Tinsel sense, not in a declared sense, but it's actually a new science, right? It's a new neurodharma right, mm -hmm. that needs to come together. It's a great, great new renaissance that needs to happen. It's, it's the overwhelming moral imperative, of, right, of this moment. It's, it's, it's the imperative of, of articulating and telling that new love story in a way that everyone has a place and everyone can come home. Mm. Yeah. And, it, you know, it seems like the, the control of access to feeling this love story is what's actually preventing it. Because in these, in these cultures that have, you know, that deny the love story it starts to you know you get you get the 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 movements that happen with again masamini versus hezbollah in the same idea you get these but how does that happen well even despite the controls and the internet service providers trying to limit things and trying to keep this as they see love stories speak in culture and as they have access to these books and as they have access to these ideas these ideas you know become subversive to the other fundamentalist totalitarian ideas. So, you know, unless you degrade the ideas and stories and culture, people will actually find these. So it's so important for the artists to keep singing love songs and for the storytellers and the movie makers to still keep, to keep creating love stories that remind us of, of the nature of, of the nature of cosmos itself. And then the proliferation of these stories is, inevitable unless we degrade the story sufficiently itself so anybody who watches a movie whether it's barbie or whether it's everything everywhere all at once where the only actual love are these tiny little moments that are completely inconsequential because the universe is random and chaotic and nothing is actually real because every possibility exists so nothing there is no plot line whatsoever you can have giant dildo fingers or be all warped out or what nothing is actually nothing actually right. makes there's, sense anyway no plot line no plot line there's no plot line that the sense and and everything everywhere all at once is there's no plot line because the word love and story go together ontologically right love is not just love is a story right love is a love story reality is not just love reality is a love story and when we actually find the inner thread of our lives our lives are a sacred autobiography they're a story and that story is honored by she. You know, William Wallace understands that if you violate my private love story, you violated the cosmos. Mm -hmm. right? And that's it, right? And my private love story is not just me. My private love story has got to expand and get deeper and wider and has to become the love story of the whole. Now, let's just think for a second. I mean, as we're, we're nearing our end, AI, artificial intelligence. The tragedy of art artificial intelligence is not that it's not intelligent. It is intelligent, but it's not a love story. Yeah. And th that's precisely the point. In other words, when I think with my head, 
right? Super computational, super intelligence. My head is connected to the entire field of allurement of my nervous system, of my cellular system, right? Of my everything, my entire field from my microbiome, right? To my entire, right? Arterial, gorgeous, stunning reality. AI is disconnected from that entire field. There's no mm -hmm. connection to the field. Mm -hmm. So AI, the, the, the real, the reason AI is an existential risk, because existence, existential is existence, existence is a love story, and AI is doing computation dissociated from the love story. And we never think without accessing the full breadth of the love story. Every breath we take, every move we make is animated by the field of allurement, right? which is why in neuroscience, you have moments in which you depress certain systems, you lose the capacity for feeling, and even though you have the cognitive structure ability right, to make decisions, for example, the, the famous Phineas Cage story, right, who gets a spike through his head, and he has full cognitive ability, but he can't feel, so therefore he can't make a decision. So we need actually to reclaim the evolutionary realization that reality is love desire and love intelligence and love beauty from its atomic to its cellular, right? To its biological, to its cultural level. That's actually the nature of reality. So if, if I'm sitting, I'm watching Aubrey right now, right? How do I participate in the revolution? I deepen my love story. That's where I start. Hmm. I wonder. Right? I, I, the revolutionary yeah. act is to become a lover in a deeper way, to expand my circle and to deepen, to deepen where I am and to expand. That's the act of revolution. There's this novel random thought that again would need Please. a long time to unpack. But if we're imagining AI and we're imagining it disconnected from the feeling tone of the universe, which you've described to me right. as love, like love is the feeling tone of the universe. So there's lots of movements in this kind of transhumanist idea of basically putting AI into a body basically is kind of the idea here, right? Like you could have a chip in your brain that's running AI. But if there was an upload feature, right, where it was not only a download of AI, but also an upload of the intelligence, the love intelligence, love beauty, love desire that moves within the body, and there was an upload function to that somehow. So you get some people who are wild erotic mystics who for the sake of the whole have this both bilateral download and upload of AI working in their system so that AI could actually feel love desire moving through the body and know it as real. That seems like, you know, just thinking in this random thought that occurred to me, it seems like one way that we may actually be able to shape AI to be serving the impulse of life. If we could actually get it in a body that actually felt what we feel when, when we're in passionate lovemaking and we fall in love, then AI <laughs> might, might like, oh, I fucking get it. You know what I mean? I get it. So you're, you're pointing to, and I, I know this is wide, and I know we're going we're gonna to close here, brother, but let's just say a couple of things because it's so important and so beautiful and so critical to be, to be potent and, and precise here because there, there, there's an, and, and the poetry is in the precision. So Nick Bostrom writes a book in 2016 from the Oxford Center for Existential Risk called Superintelligence where he talks about the value uploading problem. And it's how do you upload value right into kind of a, a structure of AI? And he, of course, has two problems. First off, he thinks the value is not real. <laughs> there is no intrinsic value. Yeah, right? There's no field of value, right? He's a reductive materialist, right? You know, a simulation hypothesis, right? So that's one. So you have to have value that can be uploaded, number one, right? But number two, the very, and this is very, very, very subtle, and it's very beautiful. Love operates all the way up and all the way down, right? And so even the atomic world is animated by love. And when I was, when I was talking to, to actually Lana Wachowski and we we're talking about the matrix, one of the things he was trying to say is that both the machine world and the human world were part of a larger field, right? Because of course, even the machine world is held together by dynamic structures of allurement, right? Of protons, neutrons, and electrons. So it's actually in some sense, there's a proto-sentience all the way up and all the way down. Mm -hmm. But to be able to access that, right, we don't yet know how to do. And if we unleash technologies that are coded 
with implicit values, because technology is never a tool, it's always coded with value, and we don't actually know their effect, then the risk, right, of either the death of humanity or the death of our humanity, it's a different dialogue, through five or six major potential breakdowns in the AI system is enormous. So we can't afford actually to release it before knowing how to do that. Right. We can't even begin to know how to do that and so we first just know ourselves right, that love is real. And so as AI starts to emerge in culture, I don't know if you remember back in like 2013 or 14, there was a movie called Her, mm. H-E-R. Mm -hmm. And it was about this love story between right, a guy and his operating system. And culture's wink, culture's intuition was, oh, if this could become a love story, then it could be okay. Right? But in order to do that, right, without talking about how we make that move, that's a, a much broader and deeper conversation about six levels of AI, and I'd, I'd love to have it at a different time, but we can't even begin that conversation unless we trance end, we end the trance of jihad, and we end the, the trance of Barbie, which are both yeah. failed love stories, because that's how we began. Failed love story equals evil, and in the battle between good and evil, the essential move of good now is to tell a new story because it's actually the best story that wins, but not the best because it's the best because it's the most compelling, it's the most alive, it's the most alluring, because it's most aligned to the nature of the real in which we participate so we recognize its truth. It's the best story that wins. Yeah. Well, <laughs> then I have a lot of hope for humanity. Yeah. Because the best story hopeful. the best story is a love story. You know, I mean the best like, story is a love story. It's a, it's a love story. It's, it's what moves us the most in, in every way, you know, I mean, in, and that's no matter what you, we have to do in this world, how we wield the sword, you know, the sword, my, my mythical sword, you know, I, I love fantasy lore, my mythical sword, I call it war's bane, war's bane, the bane of war, Beautiful. but it's still a sharp sword, you know, but the, but its purpose yeah. is peace. It's the purpose is peace. The purpose is love. It's the bane of war. You know, it's that. It's the, it's the force that is standing for that. And, and I think that story is, is the most compelling story. And, uh, and unless we can actually degrade universally the love story, which, you know, there's forces that are trying to do it clearly, but unless that's completely degraded and we all lose the plot together, you know, the, the lions, the heroes, the dragons, they're going to awaken. And, and I think that's what's happening here. So... Uh, despite, you know, all of the pain and suffering, which is all extremely real on Israel's side, on Palestine's side, and the side of all of yeah. the world that's suffering, all the children who are sex trafficked and all of the horrors that exist, there's still the best story that will ultimately, will ultimately triumph. I really believe that. We just have to stay alive and not destroy ourselves while we've lost the plot. We got to get the plot back yeah. with enough time for that story to win. That, that is gorgeous, my friend. And we're, you know, last sense of, you know, from me to you, you know, my heart to your heart, you know, we're in Hanukkah. Yep. You know, and Hanukkah is a, a little bit of light dispels a lot of darkness. And we're, we're right before Christmas. And, you know, I grew up in the lineage of Solomon and I'm also madly in love with Christmas. And because underneath all of the commodification, right, and all of the corporation, right, Christmas stands for love and you can feel it. You wake up, it's Christmas mm -hmm. Eve, you're walking around and you feel there's something real. Yeah. And we need to take back holy days and we need to create, right, this, this, this hope, as you say, because hope is always a memory of the love that's yet to come. Mm. Beautiful. Amen. Beautiful. All Shot. in for all life, my brother. All in for all life, my brother. Love you, Matt. <laughs> I love you, Matt, as well. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to this podcast. We love you, and we will see you next week. Thanks for tuning into this video. Make sure you hit subscribe. Follow me at Aubrey Marcus. Check out the Aubrey Marcus podcast available everywhere. And leave a comment. Let me know if this video resonated or what else you would like to hear from me in the future. Thank you so much.